Uh, good morning. Thank you guys so much for having me join you all. Um, so I'm a PhD candidate in the MIT HUI Joint Program um, in Oceanography, and I've been working with uh, some of the folks at the town of Nags Head, as well as some people at the town of Duck, to do a project called iFlood, um, where we're trying to understand how groundwater contributes to flooding across uh, barrier islands. Um, and so there are kind of two key components to how groundwater contributes to flooding. Uh, the first process is rainfall, and the second uh, contribution is ocean waves and storm surge. So in uh, a coastal aquifer, the increase in the water table owing to contributions from rain can be up to five times larger than the amount of rainfall received across the island. And that's because as the water infiltrates into the aquifer, it can only kind of fill space that's not already taken up by sand. So if we are looking here at a schematic of the outer banks, uh, the, so you have the land surface here, um, the ocean and the dashed line sort of shows you the profile of the water table. And so when you have rain, that water infiltrates into the aquifer across and elevates the water table all the way across the island. Um, and then you get flooding owing to this increase in groundwater anytime the water table kind of pops up above the land surface. Um, in addition to these big rain events, um, we see flooding associated with big changes in the shoreline water level, and those are driven by wind, waves, and low pressure, and they increase the water in the ocean, and the groundwater table right at the shoreline is going to increase in response to that change in forcing. And over time, the dune kind of acts as a big sponge and it sucks up all of this water from the ocean and it begins to transmit it inland. So over time, you're gonna see the water table sort of start to come up. And then after the storm receives, the water table is gonna remain elevated and this high groundwater can continue to propagate inland as uh, it also discharges back out to the ocean. And similar to uh, the rainfall stuff, we also see flooding when the water table exceeds the land surface um, owing to these sort of surge driven processes. And um, if the water table has been already elevated owing to a prior storm, or you can also see extended durations of flooding owing to surface ponding. So the goal of this product project has been to be able to predict those responses to the change in the coastal water table. Um, driven by both these surge processes and rainfall, and then identify regions across the outer banks with recurrent flooding issues. Um, so there's sort of been a three-stage approach to how we've done this. Um, the first was to develop an analytical flooding model that will predict how the water table changes in response to those rain and surge forcings. And then the second part of this project was to develop a citizen science flooding app that would enable us to evaluate the model performance and expand awareness of groundwater flooding across the outer banks. And then the last step was to simulate areas where we think we're gonna see flooding owing to groundwater. So starting kind of from this first step here, um, we are using observations that are connected, collected at the US Army Corps of Engineer Field Research Facility um, up in DEC, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with. Um, so they have uh, long-term measurements of uh, wave and tide, both in the sound and the ocean and a weather station that collects precipitation data. And then in September of 2014, we installed a transect of groundwater wells that extend all the way across the island. So everywhere you see a colored circle in this aerial image here, we have a groundwater well that you can see a photo of in the top right. And the wells, they measure conductivity, temperature, and pressure at 10 minute intervals. So this enables us to connect the changes that we see in the groundwater levels to the conditions that are happening in the ocean. So if we zoom in and look at what this actually looks like as a time series, we're looking um, here in this top panel, we're looking at the wave height measured offshore. And in the bottom panel, we're looking at groundwater head, which is the level of the water underneath the ground. And the colors of the curves correspond to the locations in the inlet map. So the blue is our furthest inland sensor and our black sensors closest to the ocean. And what you can should kind of be able to pick out here is anytime that you have the wave height increase offshore, we see a corresponding increase in the groundwater head um, under the ground. And if we zoom in on some of these bigger events, such as Hurricane Joaquin in 2015 and Hurricane Matthew in 2015, uh, 2016, that increase in the water table can be up to a meter and a half. So to 
give you a sense of scale, I'm about five foot. So before the storm, if I'd been standing where the water table was at the after the storm, it would be up kind of about my eyes. So this is a really big change in the underground water level. And we think this is what's driving some of the flooding processes that we see along the coast. Um, and if we zoom in and look at one of these guys in more detail, you can actually see that this high groundwater level propagates inland over time. So there's actually a delay up to a couple of days at where you see when you see the max water level come through. And so we came up with a model that we hoped would describe this prop propagation process. And um, practically what this means is we think we can predict the max water level within about 10 centimeters following one of these storms and also predict the timing of when you'll see that high water level within about a day or so. And we applied this to all of the storms that we had in that long time series I just showed you. And we felt pretty confident that we're able to reproduce the behavior that we are seeing in these 26 storm events. Um, so the next stage of this project was now that we have a working model, we wanted to be able to test it to see how well it can predict flooding across the outer banks. And so we worked with the town offices in Duck and Nags Head to develop a citizen science app called iFlood. And what iFlood does is it enables users in the communities to go out and send us floating photos when they see flooding in the, their communities. And we get a location, a picture, um, answers to some survey questions that show us kind of when we see uh, floods in in the communities. And we've had a lot of help from the town offices advertising the app on social media when we see a storm approaching the Outer Banks. We also put it out on a citizen science data repository and presented the app at an Outer Banks Green Drinks chapter meeting. And this approach has been really successful in getting people to use the app. And between uh, September 2019 and February 2020, we received 35 reports through the app, which was really great for our project. Um, and so in this map, you can actually see the locations of where we received the flood reports. So the colored circles uh, correspond to flood reports that we received through the app. The color of the circle shows you um, the depth of the re flood reported by the user. So red is about knee deep, green is ankle deep, and blue, they didn't uh, respond. So that's, uh, so we got reports um, along a 70 kilometer stretch of the Outer Banks from Duck all the way down to Redantha. And um, the highest density of reports that you can sort of see from this map comes from Nags Head. And a lot of these reports were actually received after Hurricane Dorian as well. And so what we did was we then took the model that I have that predicts where the water table is and applied it to all of these reports that we received to try and decide whether the model is accurately predicting flooding that's consistent with the reports that we're receiving through the app. And we found that for about 75% of our Oceanside reports, our model's doing a really good job of predicting uh, flooding that's consistent with the timing and the location of the data we're getting from the app. So that's a really encouraging sign for us that the model is working well. And then we have some predictive capabilities of when we're likely to see flooding. And so the last thing that we uh, did with this was to try and apply it to say, okay, now that we have a model that predicts where the, how the groundwater is gonna respond, what happens, uh, where are we likely to see flooding in one of these larger events? So that's what we're looking at in this map here. Um, again, we're looking at a map of the outer banks with north rotated off to the left, it's kind of standing, and the region extends from duck down to nag set. And what the color, colors show you is how much rainfall uh, you would need to, we predict that you need to flood a region um, after the shoreline water level has increased about 2.25 meters, which would be consistent with a nor'easter or a larger hurricane. And so the regions in red have uh, flooded just by the groundwater processes alone. Uh, regions shaded uh, light pink, uh, you'd need about 10 centi centimeters to flood. And regions in gray and black are, we think are fairly unlikely to flood under these conditions just from the groundwater processes. Um, and then the green circles on this map are again uh, where we received our flood reports through the app. Um, and so this has kind of highlighted two sort of higher risk regions for flooding for us, one sort of north of Duck and one uh, sort of just south in the southern section of Nags Head. Um, and then we found approximately 11% of the Oceanside land area is about is likely to flood under these conditions just from groundwater. 
Um, and so if we actually zoom in on this region here in Nags Head, where we received most of our flood reports, um, you can see some of the uh, finer patterns in where we think this flooding is going to occur. A lot of it, um, both from what we received through the app and what this uh, simulation predicts for uh, storm shows flooding that's occurring sort of right along NC12, which as I know is a region where this commun the community has invested a lot of money in doing repairs after storms. So we think that's still uh, kind of an area of vulnerability to these processes. Um, and so uh, that's uh, kind of some of the data that we get uh, from the simulation. And so to kind of wrap up, um, we think this uh, collaboration with the town offices has been super successful. We're really fortunate to have received 35 flood reports from the app um, and that we believe that our model is working well to reproduce the flooding that we see from groundwater and that we've had such strong engagement from the community um, sending us reports from the app. Um, and then moving forward, the next thing I'm kind of hoping to do is to work with uh, another university um, in Canada who has a numerical model that predicts uh, the offshore conditions and use that to be able to do some forecasting of where we might see flooding in advance of a storm. So um, that's kind of what I have. And I'm really happy to take any questions that you guys have about this project. Um, um. I, I want to really uh, thank you, Rachel, for that uh, really nice, clear presentation. Um, it, it, it's interesting as you were presenting that your your graphs about the elevation of the water table over over time. I was I was sitting here thinking, well, that's a that's a perfect portrait of South Nags Head and some other areas in town. And then you verified it when you got to the end. In fact, that 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 is what's happening there. What makes flooding in that area is so devilish for us as we try to, you, you know, find a way to help the folks who, who live down there. And now you've applied some science to this and, and a better understanding. And I would only ask uh, one additional thing as you go forward into that next step, it would be nice if it is uh, a predictive and is reliable, if there was a, an interface that could alert town staff, let's say, or okay. sit um, through that so that we would know that there were certain measures we needed to put in place, um, you know, to restrict traffic or whatever else we needed to do. And it sort of was a pop-up alert, uh, almost like you get on your phone for weather events. And then we would, we could respond and, and even residents could sign up for that so that they would okay. be aware when flooding might occur. Um, with that, I'll ask uh, board members if they have any questions or comments or observations. Um, a bit, a bit. Uh, this is Webb. Um, I, I totally concur with what you said, and Rachel, thank you a lot. Um, just one step further with the mayor's comment is my takeaway is no matter what type of drainage system we put in down there, we're still gonna have the same issues. I, am I correct? Isn't that the takeaway? I mean, I think, yeah, I think the, the takeaway is definitely that groundwater is contributing to the flooding that Nags Head is, is seeing. And I think, uh, I know David Ryan uh, has been working on some you know, pumping systems and that's something that I think will help hopefully mitigate some of these issues, but, um, yeah, my focus is mostly on understanding, you know, where there is a problem currently. And I, I, yeah, so I think that's kind of the takeaway. Okay. Um, um, thank you. I th I'm totally into the, I think we need to go into a warning system similar yeah. to like other communities. Venice is the perfect example of where people are warned about flooding and there's nothing that they can do, but at certain levels, um, but it just makes sense to me we move in that direction. Yeah. But thank you for the report. Thank you, Rachel, for your study. I think it was very informative. Very good. Th thank you, Rachel. We look forward to hearing uh, more about this project. Um, and uh, I'll also, uh, before we let you go, I'll also express my gratitude to the town staff who've helped and participated in this. and to any citizens who may have made those uh, flood reports. Um, yeah, that's very helpful. So thank you, Rachel.
Yeah, thank you so much.